Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank John and the speakers in the first session for a stimulating conversation earlier. We're going to move now to our second session of the day, where we're going to look at the use of population descriptors by biobanks and other large scale genetic research programs or other large scale research programs. This session will be moderated by our committee member, Anne Morning. Take it away, Anne. Great. Thank you so much, Charmaine. Uh, I'm Anne Morning. I'm a sociologist and demographer at New York University. And I want to extend a very warm welcome to the speakers who are joining us now for our second session of today's workshop. Um, so we'll be building on the first session that just looked at the uses of population descriptors in genetic research and various kinds of studies. And now, as Charmaine mentioned, we're going to be turning to the question of how uh, biobanks and other large-scale research programs utilize these kinds of descriptors, with also particular attention to the question of how legacy data might be managed and merged with future data. So as with the previous session, we are going to again have 15-minute presentations from each of our speakers. That'll be followed by a discussion with our committee members, and I'll also remind the audience that they can submit questions. Um, so those of you viewing the, the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions in the box on the event webpage. Uh, now, because of our time constraints, I'm not going to be able to go over full uh, details of the speaker's biographies, but you can read about them in our briefing book, which is available on the meeting materials, uh, meeting materials section of the event webpage. So we're lucky to have really three terrific speakers in this section. We're going to start with Dr. Phil Sau from Stanford University, move on to Dr. Alice Popejoy from the University of California at Davis, and then round it up with Dr. Mashal Sohail of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over right now to our first speaker, Phil Sau, who is Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine, as well as Associate Chief of Staff for R&D at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Anne, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be here for this important public forum. Um, as Anne just mentioned, I am participating in and co-principal investigator of the VA's Million Veteran Program. And as such, uh, today, I wanted to introduce you to the program as well as uh, tell you a bit generally about the program, as well as some of the uh, population descriptors that we've been using, and then really use the discussion period to hear your comments, as well as your suggestions on how we move forward, since MVP is a ongoing cohort, and we're always looking to change uh, for the improvement of the data quality, as well as the discoveries made for our, um, for our veterans. Next slide, please. So uh, the driving force for uh, MVP is really to prevent and treat disease in veterans by using genetic lifestyle and military exposure information. And it started out as really a discovery program. And we hope that the discoveries inform medical care. But at this point in time, we have not uh, used the data to be actually return to our veterans quite yet. Uh, we believe that MVP aligns with the strategic initiatives of the VA which is uh, to make VA data work for veterans, having real world impact, importantly to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really to build community. And, so, and, and, and importantly also as well, we hope that this information is uh, used to increase access to high quality clinical trials for our veteran community. Next slide, please. So the Million Veterans Program is uh, a program where we, we're uh, our objective is to partner with veterans to investigate how genes, military exposure, and lifestyle influence the health and illness of our veterans. But of course, these, uh, these different uh, characteristics are fairly common in the population. So we think that this will have a remarkable effect on our national as well as worldwide health care. Uh, why do we do it within uh, the veteran community? Because veterans are a stable as well as altruistic pa patient population, stable in the sense that they often will use the healthcare system for many, many years. And uh, the, uh, elect the rich electronic health record that is part of the VA has um, 
many of you may know, the VA was the first adopter of the electronic health record here in the United States. So in many cases, there are decades of digitized data available on these individuals. Uh, importantly, the security of the data is of highest priority. So we've decided to uh, store all of our uh, MVP data in a central repository and have investigators come visit the data and actually compute on the data within our repository and then leave with their results and uh, make the conclusions there as public as possible. And our goal is to enroll at least a million individuals. I can tell you that uh, we're well on our way as we'll, you'll see in a few minutes. And so uh, there's been a commitment to go beyond that first million as well. Next slide, please. So again, why the uh, VA? Well, the VA within the United States is the largest healthcare system in the, in the country uh, with 100, over 170 medical centers dotted throughout the, the world. I'm sorry, dotted throughout the country and uh, 1100, uh, greater than 1100 uh, associated community clinics. And uh, these uh, serve our US veterans there are estimated to be about 22 million veterans in, in the United States. And uh, as recent data would show, about 9 million of those uh, individuals take, uh, um, take care within the, the Veterans Health Administration, which translates to 95 million outpatient visits and over 700,000 inpatient admissions. So again, we think that this is an ideal way to interact with uh, our individuals and introduce them to the potential of genetic biobanks for uh, discovery as well as translation. On the right, you can just see a density map of uh, where our veterans live. And the point of the slide is to show you that while there are hot spots and areas in darker colors where uh, more veterans live, the, uh, the vast majority uh, of them uh, are spread throughout the country as well. Next slide, please. And uh, the VA also is the embodiment of a living healthcare system. So funded by Congress is not only uh, the hospital side of the VA, but also a research side where there uh, is a dedicated budget to research development. That, uh, that research stems from uh, early basic science studies all the way through translational and as well as clinical trials. And I mentioned specifically clinical trials, the Cooperative Studies Program is a network of, of uh, organizations across the country, which are designed to facilitate and accelerate clinical trials uh, within the VA system. Next slide, please. So participation in MVP is, uh, we're trying to make it as relatively straightforward and as simple as possible. Of course, we'd like to take advantage of the uh, electronic, dense electronic healthcare information. So we would hope that uh, as a VA veteran, that you would uh, be a, a user of the VA healthcare system. And then you provide informed consent. Initially, we did this mostly uh, in person or by mail, but now we have an online portal which we, that can happen electronically as well. And then uh, the, you are offered uh, right now two different surveys to fill out, uh, common uh, surveys that would be a baseline survey as well as a more comprehensive uh, lifestyle survey. And um, in addition, provide one uh, 10 ml tube of blood that we could use for not only genetic studies but other future measurements as well. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you, uh, the veterans allow for uh, both uh, on both uh, historical as well as future access to their electronic health records. And importantly, they agree to future contact for further research studies. So there are the capability of follow-up studies as well. And of course, uh, HIPAA authorization for us to be able to share our data with our, uh, uh, our partners, our investigative partners. Next slide, please. So this slide just tells you um, on the right-hand side, you see where we've been recruiting across the country. And this looks like uh, the map that I showed you earlier in terms of the density of individuals, uh, of veterans. And uh, so it of course started with those sites that had high traffic areas. And uh, over, over the last 10 years, we've had 78 sites that have been opiate of which are still active today. And, uh, um, engaged included over close to a million uh, mailings um, to, to our, our veterans, informing them about P and to join. And then um, 
in individual contacts could be by face-to-face -face in, in the hospital setting and or you know, phone calls and such. And on the left, you see that uh, that has resulted in over, as of this week, 885,000 individuals who have consented and enrolled in the program. And you can see also that uh, we uh, have a rich um, uh, uh, inclusion of the different surveys and uh, making that data available to our investigators as well. Next slide, please. I mentioned that, that there are all these sites across the country and what happens to their blood sample, it is uh, immediately refrigerated. And then at, at the end of the day, the, all the collected samples are sent by Blue Ice to uh, a, a central repository in Boston where they're quickly processed into uh, DNA as well as plasma. A fraction of the DNA is made into, I'm sorry, a fraction of the bucket code is made into DNA. And so then uh, aliquots of DNA, buffy code, as well as plasma are then frozen away. So um, next slide, please. And the workhorse of our genetic studies has been genotyping. We designed a custom genotype array uh, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, which it was built on the backbone of the Axiom Biobank array, which the UK Biobank uses as well. And we've added content for population structure as well as uh, different um, medical information. Next slide, please. This is our compute environment. So on the left-hand side, you see the sources of our, our data, whether it be VA or non-VA data. We've also contracted to different uh, entities to uh, produce the molecular data. And all that is put into a central data core. And then uh, beyond the two lines in the vertical lines in the middle are supposed to be uh, at the firewall that allows um, us to be able to control what data gets portioned out to the different studies or study marks. And so the individual investigators wouldn't have access necessary to all of the data. They have to propose what they want to use the data for. And then once they're approved, then a specific study mark of data will be made available to them based on their needs as well as the questions they want to answer. Next slide, please. This just gives you a quick, um, uh, and I'm sorry, some of the slides have been, parts have been cut off, but you can see that uh, this is the different age uh, breakdown of the individuals. And the only thing I wanted to point out here is that we have a, a full range of ages, um, and but uh, the vast majority of them uh, uh, follow the uh, service in, in our military. For example, right now, the largest population comes from the Vietnam era. Next slide, please. These are self-reported conditions and uh, you'll see a lot of common diseases here, whether it be high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, sleep apnea, et cetera. And um, the point of this is again to say that while there are enriched uh, phenotypes like PTSD within the military population, uh, many, if not most, of the common uh, diseases as well as phenotypes are represented in our population as well. And so we think that this has translational value to the, the civilian population in addition to the veteran population. Next slide, please. Okay, so this gets to uh, part of what we wanted to talk about today. And this is basically our demographics. Um, uh, and, uh, and this is a self-report in terms of what they have responded on their, uh, their survey data. Next slide, please. And, and this just gives you an example. There are, there are at least two areas where we collect self-identified uh, race ethnicity. And that's, of course, uh, from natural, uh, um, uh, natural language processing of the electronic health record itself, as well as what they provide in the survey data. And you can see that I just cut and paste the first page of our baseline survey, where they can tell us um, what they identify is in terms of race, as well as where they think their ancestors come from. And uh, this is compared to what is in the electronic health record. And between the two of them, that uh, provides um, about 97, 90, 96% of our participants actually have some evidence of self-identified race. Now, it wouldn't be surprising to you that uh, sometimes that differs between the electronic health record as well as the survey data. 
And so uh, that's something we have to deal with on a global basis as well. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, because uh, all of our participants are genotyped, I told you we have 885 participants now. We have uh, genotyped and curated as well as QC'd 650,000 of those individuals, and then uh, released that data to, the, uh, to our approved investigators. And so, of course, we can get genetically inferred ancestry as well. Next slide, please. I did want to very quickly tell you that um, they, we developed the HAIR algorithm, which was a, um, a way to try and harmonize uh, anything, that, the information that we have from self-reported ancestry, as well as uh, the uh, genetic ancestry. This is a support vector machine that was um, developed in collaboration with multiple investigators across the country. And the next slide just shows you that the result of that is uh, bidding into four basic categories of race, ethnicity, and you can see the breakdowns there. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to speed through and just tell you that um, uh, the, the, the same issue with the electronic health record, the, the benefit of the electronic health record is the density of data. The issue with the, uh, the, density, of the uh, density of the data is that sometimes there's discrepancies as well as there's also uh, multiple measurements for the same phenotype that you're interested in. So um, that we do a lot of adjudication, we make this as transparent as possible to our investigators. And importantly, for our investigators, they might be interested in a phenotype which not, may not be readily available from a simple ICD-9 code or, or et cetera. So we actually uh, allow them to come up with their phenotypes. And then importantly, on the next slide, we have now developed a, a central repository for phenotypes as well. Um, next slide, please. And that's called Cypher. And this is where individuals, as well as the core, will put their phenotype definitions, again, make them as transparent as possible, and allow people to either use them and replicate uh, the, the, the uh, data or uh, deposit their own phenotypes as they see fit. Next slide, please. Okay, so going forward then, um, we're exploring different strategies for interacting with our uh, veterans, including uh, the what I said before about online um, consenting as well as survey completion. We've also uh, tested and piloted going to them for their blood uh, collection. We think that's very important for individuals who don't live at an area uh, that's dense, uh, uh, a high urban area or anything like that. Uh, and next slide, please. And then just a list and you can, you can see this uh, and you'll have copies of this uh, of our future plan for genomics and which include multi-omics. And so in summary, then we think the MVP program is not only a major research initiative, but also has the capability of informing uh, all, uh, about healthcare as well as health traits. And, and importantly, uh, it's very diverse uh, in, in terms of uh, the population cohort. Last slide, please. Uh, Phil, I'll Just have to, to ask you to wrap up in 30 seconds. <laughs> you got I'll, I was just saying is thank you to, and I mean, uh, MVP involves hundreds of people across the country. I've just highlighted here the executive community that helps make the decisions. And then some of the data that I've talked about, the genotyping team, as well as uh, the individual who came up with the hair algorithm. And the absolute last slide is, of course, a few pictures of our veterans who are the most important component of this uh, equation. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions during the uh, question and answer session. Great. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, and again, thank you for being with us.